kicking off the second session now, uh, Mita Griffin and I are going to present a bit of work, which is still work in progress for the most part, uh, particularly the part that I'm going to do. Um, so I'll kick off with uh, a couple of studies that are very much at the early stages and, and get you maybe inside some of the mechanics of what we're trying to do and talk a bit about some of the data issues and some of the, the ways in which the data that local authorities have been collecting for years can be linked up with data that's available on health outcomes and so on in the, in the broad area of, of drinking water uh, and health. Uh, media then will take over to talk about some more developed work, but which goes on to, to sort of the second stage of this kind of uh, inquiry where we start to think about health service utilization that's associated ultimately with uh, drinking water borne disease. Uh, this is all joint work as ever with lots of people involved. So Anne Nolan, you've heard from already and has, is involved in this work. Also Brendan Walsh and Greta Moen at the ESRI. Uh, Colleen Ohisha at the Health Protection Surveillance Center is a collaborator. For reasons that you'll see later, we, we're gonna use their data. The, the HPSC is probably better known as the, the group that um, collects and provides all the, uh, the data on uh, COVID yeah, cases and so forth. Okay, if I can get this to change, there we go. Okay, so the, the, the two studies we're gonna talk about, the one I'm gonna describe uh, first is around drinking water quality and health. So this is very much the same kind of method that Ann Nolan was describing earlier, where we're taking a, a, a health database that, that has information on, um, on people's health outcomes and socioeconomic circumstances and marries that up with data on an environmental uh, influence, in this case, uh, exceedances on water quality uh, metrics. And Mita's work is the cost around the cost, uh, cost of acute health care from waterborne illnesses in Ireland. So it's about how, you know, what's, what's the, the cost to the health system, if you like, from these kinds of problems. Okay. So kicking off with my one. So you'll probably be, some of you uh, from the local authority side will be more familiar with this than I am indeed, how these data are collected. But for many years, uh, local authorities have been monitoring drinking water across the country. And uh, this data has been collected and now resides in, in a, a complete form in the EPA's uh, Safer Data Archive. Um, so we're going to link those data, which is pretty voluminous, with the tilde data that Ann Nolan was talking about on older people in Ireland and to try to see how people's local water quality relates to their health outcomes. And the point of linkage is the residential address. So we know where people in tilde live, as Ann Nolan was mentioning when she was talking about uh, green spaces and the effect those might have. Uh, we also therefore know where their residences are vis-a-vis -vis water systems to the extent that they're connected to one. Uh, and obviously, if they're not connected to a water system, by and large, they're going to be connected to a well. So we can, we can take a lot of information from that, link it up with the other information in tilde on socioeconomic circumstances of individuals, how well off they are, and so forth, and then ultimately model the effects of particular kinds of water pollution from the uh, the water sampling data on health and well-being of the individuals across many domains. Um, the second uh, study I'll, I'll touch on briefly takes a, a sort of almost opposite perspective, and it, it, it takes the f advantage of the fact that in the Health Protection Surveillance Center's data, they capture by law essentially all notified cases of uh, disease from infectious diseases that are arise from a range of named illnesses. And those include a number of typically waterborne illnesses, or at least partially waterborne illnesses. So here the, the approach is to take, to link all the locations of disease cases that have arisen, again, residences, with the local conditions that might have led to those cases of disease. So that would include things like reported uh, uh, infectious agents in the water, but also other kinds of local uh, conditions like weather, uh, like the socioeconomic makeup of the area, whether the people in the area tend to be on wells or on group schemes of different kinds and so forth. And ultimately, therefore, to kind of answer the question, what kinds of conditions in a local area 
tend to lead to cases of in particular in infectious diseases. So the the safer data, um, uh, the safer uh, data on water monitoring results is quite voluminous. The piece of the data set we're looking at stretches from 2010 to 2017 plus the year 2019. Uh, over 2 million water monitoring results in that period, about 230, 250,000 per annum, which sounds like an awful lot, and it is. But there's a lot of, of heterogeneity, a lot of variety within that. And if we're interested in drilling down to a particular disease, there might not be quite as large a sample as we might think, just looking at the top line number. Uh, the other thing to say is that, of course, only a very small number of those samples lead to exceedances. In other words, cases, examples, tests, results where the, uh, the water had in it more of a pollutant than reg regulation allows. Um, so, you know, we, we, we'll find that in very many cases, we were actually going to be observing high quality water, or at least variations in quality of water that are below exceedance level. Um, there are two important things as we set these data up, and we're kind of at the point of having just set them up. So I want to sort of describe those to you, and, and it sort of illustrates some of the issues that we have in making these kinds of linkages. First of all, clearly not all parameters or water systems are sampled equally. So there are a lot of outcomes like pH, taste, odor, E. coli, coliforms, which are sampled much, much more often in the body of samples or on average across the, uh, the, the set of water systems being sampled than other kinds of pollutants like heavy metals uh, or infectious agents. So if we wanna study one of those causes, we'll have a lot more sample to work with than we will if we want to look at, you know, mercury or lead or something like that, where fewer samples have been taken. The other really big source of variation is in the sampling by water system. So this chart lines up all the water systems in the country from uh, the least sampled to the most in the data that we have. So it's approximately nine years of data. Well, it is nine years of data. And you can see here that there, you can think about maybe three groups within water systems. There's a small number of water systems that are extremely infrequently sampled, maybe once per year on average in the nine years that we look at, at this. And that's across all 80 odd substances. So you may well not observe anything for these water systems for a particular pollutant that you're interested in. The bulk of water systems are sampled, you know, more like, uh, 10 to 100 times a year. And so you might be getting towards a sample that you might be able to use there, but it's still a pretty infrequent rate of sampling given that there might be a pollutant in the water system only for a brief period. And then there are a small number of water systems that are sampled very frequently, more than a thousand times uh, per annum, say, within the, within, the, uh, within the data set. So those ones we clearly are gonna have enough data to do something with, but it, it may not be the water systems that where, where, where the, the pollution of interest is arising. How we go about connecting these data then, um, obviously it needs to, to involve some kind of connection between water systems and the residences of people that we observe in tilde or in, in, in the HPSC CIDR data set. So this set of blobs is taken from somewhere in the Midlands from the 2009 map of water systems um, provided by the local government computer services board at one point. And each of these blobs represents a piece of a water system. And we have codes associated with these such that we can link them to the water quality results in the EPA safer database. We then can superimpose the households from tilde or from cider. And these are just randomly generated households, but you can imagine a similar density of households from one of those surveys. Um, and each household will either be associated with a water system or it won't. And if it's not, we can control for that fact. Maybe it's on a well or maybe it's on an unobserved water system. But if it's on a water system, we can assign the pollution, any pollution observed on that water system or lack of pollution to that particular household and therefore to the tilde record to look at whether there was any health outcome from that pollution. So we've now linked in data on all the tilde respondents in 2009 to 11, including health, age, 
sex, housing conditions, and so forth. Um, and we've linked in the water test results and exceedances that I described. What we haven't done yet is to actually then an, analyze the, the, the health outcomes that might be associated with those exceedances. On the other study, we've linked the uh, HPSC events, um, or, or actually we're still in progress. We, we've done the kind of some of the spatial work on this, but the actual HPSC is a bit busy with COVID. So we haven't, we've been held up a little bit on that side, but we're, the game plan is to link the HPSC cases of cryptosporidiosis, jardiasis, norovirus, and VTEC to all, again, of all of the water test results in the relevant areas, plus a whole bunch of other characteristics of those areas. And having done both of those sets of linkage, we're going to, you know, obviously try to use statistics, probably regression models to relate health outcomes to those water quality indicators. And secondly, to expo explore local conditions that might be associated with disease, which hopefully will have some policy uh, learnings out of it. So I'll hand over to Mita at this point to talk about the second study. You're on mute, Mita. Yes, I hope everyone can hear me now. Great, thanks, Sean. Um, so as Sean said, this, this work was carried out with uh, Brendan Walsh of the ESRI as well. Um, and the objective is really to, to estimate the societal cost of water-related diseases in Ireland. And I suppose the motivation for this comes from, you know, we, we've heard a lot about it from, from Sean, also from, from Emer Cotter in her opening remarks too. Um, but there, there is a lack of systematic and accurate information on the extent of waterborne illnesses in, in Ireland, in Europe more broadly, and, um, and on their impact on public health as identified by the World Health Organization in several reports. And it, this, these, um, these diseases can, can lead to serious illness among vulnerable groups. So among very young children, among the elderly, uh, immunocompromised people, among others. And as Emer mentioned as well, there, you know, Ireland has the highest incident rate for VTEC, which is the type of E. coli in the EU for, for several years. So, so it is a, a, an important area for study. So two outputs were kind of envisaged from this work. The first focuses on hospital cost um, and within that, the, the demographic and regional variation and kind of temporal variation that's, that, that we can find in those costs. And then a second piece will look at wider societal costs. So this could be things like direct medical costs, the cost of going to a GP or paying for over-the-counter medication, indeed non-medical costs such as buying bottled water if a boil water notice is issued, and then more intangible costs, indirect or social costs like lost earnings due to absenteeism from work and so forth. So we'll be focusing on, on that first part today on the hospitalizations. Thanks, Sean. So this um, table here shows our, the, the, these are our kind of main results on the hospital cost of water-related diseases. And our kind of main result from this is, is an estimate of, of 15 million euro from, um, or, or between 8.4 and 25.3 million euro for water-related diseases over the course of 2015 to 2018. And how we arrive at that figure is by looking at hospital inpatient inquiry data. And this is from the Healthcare Pricing Office. Um, this is HSE data, so you know, but based on the all the activity in Irish public hospitals um, during that, that time frame. And we have very detailed information on why people are admitted to hospitals. And we select then 14 diagnoses or, or you know using specific codes that can allow that are commonly identified as water related in in international literature and Irish literature and you can see those there on the in the first column on the left and we focus particularly on four of those rotavirus campylobacteriosis cryptosporidiosis and VTEC which is a form of E. coli um, as four particular um, diagnoses of interest and so we look at the cases associated with all of these water related diseases in the data, but we know that not all of these will be related to waterborne pathogens. There can be foodborne transmission, animal to person, person to person transmission and so forth. So what we do is again, draw on the international literature, 
to look at the percentage of those that can be estimated or assumed to be waterborne. And um, those are in that third column there. And so then we take our cases and uh, the associated costs from this um, hype data set and apply the proportion assumed waterborne to kind of arrive at a, a waterborne cost. And um, we calculate some bands around these to get a lower bound and an upper bound. Um, and we, we then can be, can, can, can assume that the, the true cost is, is falling within that, although it, it's quite hard to, uh, to, to get at, at, you know, very precise estimates as there's, there's quite little information already on, on exactly what proportion of cases can be uh, known to be waterborne. And so, um, as I said, this is, this is arriving at a, a figure between 8.4 and 25.3 million for those four years um, for our entire set of water-related diseases. And then um, this, is, this is more like um, about a third of this is, is coming from our four main water-related hospitalizations. So that's 2.8 to, to 8.4 million euros. So um, on the next slide here, we see uh, a particular subset of, of water-related disease um, hospitalizations, which are patients with VTEC, E. coli, and, um, and HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So this is an out a potential outcome of a VTEC infection. And it's quite serious. Um, about 28% of VTEC hospitalizations are diagnosed with HUS, and 50% of those we observe are in children aged under 12. So really concentrated among this younger group. And what's interesting is that, that, that these patients there, you can see from our table, those with, with HUS are younger on average, and they're spending um, longer in hospital, so 15 days in hospital on average, as opposed to five for those without HUS. Um, longer in intensive care, about, about a, a day in intensive care on average, and consequently, they cost a lot more. So, you know, there were no in-hospital deaths reported in this um, in, 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 in our data, gladly, um, but this can, can be fatal. And so it just shows that the importance of, of uh, looking at a particular subsets. So, so while the cost of water-related diseases might be, um, the, the, it isn't, isn't a huge burden to the state as, as, as we saw in the previous table, um, there, there are specific costs and, and falling in, uh, in, in, uh, burdens falling on particular vulnerable groups. Um, so, so then in the next slide, we have um, a, a bit more of, of an, of an in-depth look at some of the temporal and regional variation that we see um, in, in the admissions to hospitals due to these illnesses. So this is a table of emergency inpatient admissions over time. So, so um, down the side, we have our hospitals uh, anonymized, but these are 29 main major public hospitals in Ireland. And across the top, we have year season combinations. So that first column there will be January, February, and March of 2015. So um, a few things uh, can be seen here. The first, I suppose, being that um, the first two quarters of, of each year are particularly, um, you can see, see there with our red figures, that's, that's where we're seeing more um, inpatient admissions within these, um, within our main water-related disease diagnoses. So, so this fits that, that spring and summer are, are particularly um, important months for, 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 or particularly prevalent months for these um, admissions. You can see a, 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 or a difference between say, 2018 and 2015, but we, we're not inferring too much from, um, uh, we're not inferring a time trend from this due to the short nature of that, of that time. It's not, not really long enough time series to, to draw any inference. But um, another really important point is that these water-related disease admissions are highly concentrated in particular hospitals um, and specifically, so the, the hospitals here are anonymized, but I can say that they are um, non-Dublin hospitals and also children's hospitals are being affected by um, these admissions. And about five hospitals there, which are, you know, they're arranged um, in order. So the five hospitals um, that, that are seeing the most admissions are, are counting for about 30% of our, of our main water-related disease admissions. So it's, it's quite 
a heavy burden on specific hospitals that, that may have fewer resources than, than say larger Dublin hospitals. And then um, finally, a little bit on the, on the discussion and policy implications of this. So, so as I kind of alluded to before, that the cost of water-related disease hospitalizations is not um, placing a massive burden on the Irish public hospital sector. Um, so so this, this burden that we're, we're estimating to be between 5 million, 15 million, depending on how we define our, our water-related diseases, um, it, it is, it, this, this small burden is being it is affecting different hospitals and regions differently. It's also spread uh, unevenly across times of the year, across the seasons, and it affects the different age groups differently too. So um, the, the, there arises, I suppose this brings up as many questions as it answers in that um, there are certainly avenues for research on the links between hospitalization and uh, pollutant related outbreaks. And Sean has has, has kind of hinted at how um, future ESRI work will try to uh, try to maybe maybe um, get into this in a bit more detail. And thinking about the drivers of illness is also um, is also important for future work, be that agricultural pollution or private wells, which which Emer also mentioned in her uh, in her opening address. And further, then thinking about about as well from a climate perspective. Uh, and environment, how how associations with rainfall have, have been linked to increased um, exceedances in, in certain pollutants in different contexts. So that this is another another avenue. And then finally, we'll also look at, the, at these broader societal costs beyond say, and um, we're, we're capturing the kind of the tip of the iceberg here in, or in terms of the, the very severe cases, but that are few in numbers, whereas there's um, a lot uh, potentially more going on with 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 less severe cases but um, but equally that, that they that they can um, that they have a cost to people um, outside of that hospital system and and we are hoping to shed a bit more light on that. Uh, great, thanks very much, Sean and Mida. Um, so I'm just uh, stepping in uh, to to chair this second session. Um, so we have um, we've got seven or eight minutes um, for questions. Um, so. We have um, uh, one already in the Q&A, so I'd encourage people, if you have further questions, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, so, uh, Mida, I think this one is probably directed at you. Is there an acceptable level of water-related disease for the Irish health system? What would constitute an effective uh, intervention? So I think we're all familiar with the discussion around acceptable levels of, of, of illness given uh, COVID, but in the context of water-related diseases, do you have any insights there? I think, that, I think that's quite a tricky question. I suppose the the you know to some degree, um, we're, what we, what we see is not an overwhelming level of water related disease hospitalizations, and that's a good thing. We're we're glad to see that. We didn't want the figure to be uh, as big as possible, so to speak. Um, but but in terms of an acceptable level, I suppose the I think the way policy. The, the policy angle looking at this would would be focusing more on on um, on the exceedances and acceptable levels of uh, and, and hoping to target it from from that angle, and then we hope that that feeds through then to these um, to these to better public health outcomes and fewer cases in hospitals. Um, in terms of, I suppose, in terms of effective interventions, one thing that strikes me is the potential risks around around private water sources and wells, um, and I think that. Uh, you know, the EPA reports often show very high levels of drinking water quality and few exceedances in, in our public water systems, um, but that, that private private water systems and, and private wells might be a place, uh, particularly in agricultural locations, might be might be a place where we could reduce these cases. But I think that the there's still a lot more evidence we need before we uh, we get to that. So, so I wonder if Sean might have anything to add as well from his perspective. Yeah. You know, we we are familiar with the notion of um, acceptable levels of cases, but you know, I, I think the thing we sh shouldn't forget here, even if we don't have a huge number of these cases, we're operating our healthcare system at circa ninety five percent utilization, and and particularly if you're looking at cases, and and me to put up a couple of them there, where you're using critical care resources, those resources are stretched. 
So we don't want any of those cases, ideally, or we should, we should get them down to very low levels. Now, the question is, what's the, there's, there's a cost-benefit balance to be struck here. So what we don't know and what we haven't studied is, at this stage anyway, is how much would it cost to get the number of cases down further relative to the cost of treating them? And, you know, that's a, a typical health economics question, which we could have a crack at down the road with a bit more research. Uh, thanks, Sean and Lita. Can I just pick up on that, actually? And it's probably linked, I suppose, to one of your last discussion points, Nita, around the sort of broader societal costs and the, you know, the indirect costs that you were talking about as well. So I wonder, um, you know, I suppose the, the, the figures that you presented really are, I suppose, the, the tip of the iceberg. We don't really know um, in terms of, you know, GP consultations or, or medications uh, what's going on here. So do you have any, I know, this is a difficult question when you haven't had access to these data, but do you have any uh, insights from, from previous research or other studies that would sort of give you the, the I suppose, the, the disaggregation of the sort of the total costs? You know, how much um, would we expect to see in terms of acute hospital costs as opposed to, you know, the other um, sort of maybe less serious, but still very debilitating in terms of, let's say, if people are absent from work? Do we have any sense, I suppose, of the relative, relative shares of those different types of costs um, for water-related diseases? Yeah, that's, an, that's a good question, Anne. I think it also relates a little bit to the question I've just seen in, in the Q&A from, um, well, from, from Jonathan, but maybe we can get to that in a second. But um, the, I suppose there's plenty of literature on these kind of cost of illness studies. They try and get at these, these direct medical costs that are very easily available from administrative data and then the more indirect costs. In terms of the share of those, say, um, I think generally the the hospital costs the hospital costs tend to be tend to be in some ways um, because they're more because they're easier to pin down and um, the larger part whereas you've got much greater bounds around of, around around the um, the those those indirect costs. However, the indirect costs if you're thinking about the loss of, of some the, the loss of productivity due to somebody being out of work or in you know. It, uh, for, for for ten days or or so forth, that's um or, or even say three days due to a uh, uh, I don't know a, a bad stomach bug that they perhaps haven't even gone to the GP for, but but just you know stay at home resting, and um, those those all add up really quickly. So I think what what's 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 interesting as well is the incidence of those costs to the extent that the that they fall they they're out of pocket perhaps uh, particularly in Ireland I suppose with our um, with our particular healthcare system, whereas in um, uh, whereas the, the the hospital costs are falling on on the the state slash taxpayer. So, um, I'm not sure I have a, a particularly clear answer to the to the to the incidence of that, but um, but the I think the general sense is that yes, there there there's there's a lot more to this picture than than the hospital costs, but the the little bit quite hard to get a precise estimate on it. If I could come in there just to add to what Mita said, you know, really to emphasize that it's these unmeasured societal costs that are probably the really big ones. So it isn't just that I get gastroenteritis and I'm off work. It's that my child gets it and I'm off work looking after the child, right? So there's a whole lot of that kind of cost if we could, if we could only measure it. Now, it would be really interesting to get data at GP level because I think a lot of it gets dealt with there. I, I don't know any place to, to get that yet, but we're always looking. And if anybody gets any ideas, we'd love to follow them up. But one, I think, novel approach to this, and it's something we've tried to approach in, in another context, is there is data on prescriptions. So an awful lot of prescriptions are captured in a database called uh, the Primary Care Reimbursement System, PCRS. And this is, I don't know, like half of them or something, or maybe more. So if if one could get the, the appropriate, figure out what the appropriate compounds are that are being prescribed for the things that these diseases cause and get PCRS to tell you the timing of those prescriptions and the incidents across the country and so forth, you might be able to infer quite a bit from that. Okay. Um we're coming up to the end um, for this one, but I just wanted to ask one final question. Um, so Kenneth Bishop is asking, um, Sean particularly directed at you, I think in relation to the tilde um, 
uh, data and obviously I suppose the the incidence of cases obviously within uh, larger in children you know are there sources that we could use um, uh, that would be better than tilde I suppose for, for focusing on that population absolutely yeah that's a great question so we wouldn't have started with tilde for something like VTech if if it weren't the most readily available data where we would have liked to start is a data set called growing up in Ireland um, which again has spatially coded locations for very large numbers, very large samples of children, again, collected with repeated interviews of children over a long period of time. The difficulty is, and we've been trying to negotiate this for years, it hasn't been possible yet at least to get permission to link administrative data sources like you know, outbreaks of VTEC or anything else into growing up in Ireland, but we live in hope. Thanks, John. Okay, um, so I might leave it there. There's a there's a link actually, I think, which would be really useful for people, and um, it's been put up by Dorothy Stewart. So I encourage people to um, to take a look at that. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Jean O'Dwyer um, from UCC, who's our next speaker, um, and she's speaking on research. Um, great title from the water table to the kitchen table, um, and I think it's joint work with your colleague um, at TU Dublin, Paul Hines. So uh, over to you, Jean. Here we go. I just share my screen. Can you just confirm that you can see this? Yeah, it should be coming up now in a moment. Let me. Mm. So nothing yet. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. No. Great. Okay, so everybody can see it in slideshow mode. Yep, absolutely, yeah. I'll be happy when I never have to ask that question again. Uh, so thanks a million for having me. So that was a really interesting talk just there. So I can probably um, go a bit further on it um, in terms of what we have been doing. Um, so the, the title of the presentation is From the Water Table to the Kitchen Table. So we're talking about the epidemiology of waterborne infection in Ireland uh, as we um, kind of, as we know it to be anyway. Um, so, as, as Anne said, uh, this work is primarily done by my, myself. Uh, my name is Gina Dwyer. I'm the Deputy Head of Environmental Science in UCC, and Dr. Paul Hines, who is an epidemiologist in ESHI, the Environmental Sustainability and Health Institute um, in TU Dublin. So, I'm an environmental scientist, Paul's an epidemiologist. Um, and that's why we kind of work so well together, because we both have a kind of a, a common goal or common interest, but we come it from slightly different uh, perspectives, which I'll talk about as I go through the presentation. So we've been working in this area for a while, and so we developed um, a research group, uh, which is called STEER, which is the Spatiotemporal Environmental Epidemiology Research Group. So we do a, a lot of work in this area. So I suppose... Just to put it in perspective, and a lot of these have come up in the, in the, last, um, in the last presentation, especially just talking about the, the waterborne disease burden in Ireland. And we actually have, I suppose, quite a, a significant one if we look across the EU anyway. So we already heard um, people say that the Republic of Ireland anyway has the highest incidence rate of bureautoxygenic producing E. coli or VTEC or STEC, the, depending on what country you're in. And we've we've had kind of the, the highest levels since reporting began back in 2004. Uh, it looks like it's increasing there year on year, but that's largely due to differences in reporting or we got better as reporting over time, obviously. But we have quite a, a high incidence rate of it. So it was 17.3 per 100,000 in 2020. And actually 2020 was actually a bit lower uh, than we'd normally see, likely because of limitations with reporting because of the ongoing pandemic and things like that, or people didn't present themselves to uh, GP facilities. But we also have a fairly high incidence rate of another microorganism, which is a protozoan or a parasite called cryptosporidium. Uh, so that manifests in a disease called cryptosporidiosis. And both VTEC and cryptosporidiosis are notifiable infectious diseases. So luckily for us as researchers, Joe, if you get VTEC or cryptosporidiosis, Joe, you're on a list somewhere, um, which means that we can kind of go backwards and, and look at the epidemiology of the infections and see what is kind of happening where. So as an environmental scientist and, and Paul as well, coming from a water background, we're very interested in not only environmentally associated infections, but specifically waterborne ones. And these two are largely uh, waterborne in nature. So as also said, there can be foodborne or person-to-person -person transmission, but there is a very 
obvious kind of linkage between water, the aquatic environment in Ireland and the incidence of this, these infectious diseases. So we've always been really interested in this and kind of asking, you know, why is this the case? So why is Ireland, like when you look at across the EU, granted Ireland and, and Portugal would be quite different or Spain or any of the, the hot European countries, but compared to the likes of England or Scotland or Wales, you know, we're not hugely different. So why is it you know, we have this extremely, or I won't say extremely high, but relatively high incidence of these infectious diseases within this relatively small country? Uh, so we spent a lot of our, our time and effort uh, looking at this and through this classical model of waterborne infection. So anybody who has done any kind of basic epidemiology or public health will be fairly familiar with this uh, model. It's essentially the source transport receptor model. Um, so this is what we use in terms of public health, saying that oh, there has to be a source of contamination, obviously. So there has to be a kind of transport within the, the natural environment. And then for it to be a public health concern, there has to be a receptor um, or a person you know, that, that gets infected with a disease. So to put it into very kind of simple terms, Joe, we were interested in seeing like, what do we actually know about this and generally, Joe, in terms of the sources of these infections, they're, they're fecal oral diseases. So they're, they're mainly derived from, from fecal matter, from agriculture or people. And so we know quite a bit about the source of these different infections. We also know a little bit about the receptors in terms of the people, as we said in the previous presentation, you know, children tend to be um, the hardest hit by it, as well as the immunocompromised and the elderly, the, the classical kind of manifestation of infection. And it's this transport then that we, we, we really need to know more about. And that's what we've been kind of focusing on is there's no point in saying Joe Ireland keeps on having these these high incidence rates of infection without being able to say why, because if we don't know why, then we can't actually fix it. And you know, we wouldn't be we're good scientists or whatever if we weren't trying to come up with solutions to the problems that, that currently exist. So in terms of the research that we're doing, so when they approached us to, to give a presentation today, they wanted us to talk about a specific project, which I'll mention in a minute. We actually have a couple of different projects looking at exactly this area across myriad different kind of disciplines. So, Joe, you know, it's, it's an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary problem. So it's not even an environmental problem. It's a public health problem. It's an infrastructural problem. So you need to work with a lot of people to actually you know, arrive at any sensible kind of conclusions as to what is actually happening and how we fix it. And that's what we've kind of aimed to do across our projects. So we have the, the Stepwise project, which is funded by the Environment Protection Agency. So the EPA have been very supportive in, in our research over the last number of years. And this is looking specifically at the spatiotemporal epidemiology of waterborne infections. So exactly what we're talking about today with an emphasis on, on VTEC and cryptosporidiosis. We also have another project which is called EpiCenter, which is funded by the Irish Research Council, which is looking at the epidemiology of these as well. They're kind of like sister projects, but looking at, at it from a more kind of socioeconomic perspective, looking at kind of population equality, morality, um, looking at it in terms of, of different socio-demographics. And then we have another project, which is also funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, which is looking at environmental sources of infectious disease, diseases in groundwater networks. And we have another project funded by ICRAG or Science Foundation Ireland and Geological Survey of Ireland, specifically looking at antimicrobial resistance in the Irish subsurface environment. But I've included it here because it touches on by design, really, um, the, the microbiology of, of the subsurface environment. So again, as I said at the start, you know, myself and Paul, we're, we're slightly different backgrounds, with the same common goal, um, but that's what's needed to, to tackle these issues. And we kind of see it as working from this top down perspective. So you're looking at the infectious disease data and, say, and seeing what does that tell us? But then also incorporating this bottom up research. So you know, we're actually looking in the environment. So we're, does the health data tell us there's an environmental problem? And does the environment actually confirm that that, that, that hypothesis is true? So we, we look at it from both ends. So we're doing field-based science as well as, I suppose, epidemiology and data-based science. So I'm going to talk about the projects kind of all in one um, in terms of what we do. And Joe, the overarching aim of our research, so this is across all the projects, is to really, and this is spoken about a few times throughout the day, was access to data. And really data is the baseline, having good data makes a good project, makes good results, makes good concrete conclusions. So we really wanted to, to create 
uh, a national geolinked spatio-temporal, so both space and time data set that contained gold standard uh, laboratory confirmed infection data. So that's taking it from the likes of the Health Protection Surveillance Center and the computerized infectious disease reporting system and linking it with associated drivers and pressures as we see them. Um, so obviously we liaise with different stakeholders and different people, Joe, because we could obviously miss things that we perhaps wouldn't have considered that that could be important. But the goal is to have this working data set, you know, it's available for, for use that we can use to, to come to different conclusions and to use that to fundamentally assess where, when and why uh, waterborne infections occur in Ireland so we can fix it. So as part of the, the project, you know, we're very, of all the projects, we try to make things as communicable as possible. Um, so I put my hands up as a scientist. Generally, scientists are absolutely terrible at communicating scientific messages to non-scientific audiences. So we try to make things like hotspot maps you know, that are that are colorful and you don't have to be an epidemiologist or a scientist to appreciate that where you see red, you have a problem and where you see green, Joe, you know, things aren't so bad. Uh, so we're interested in looking at risk relative to, to loads of different things, not just in space, but in time, just seasonality, uh, climate change moving forward, loads of different uh, aspects. And again, coming from an environmental science background, you know, all of this is meaningless if we're not producing like evidence-based recommendations to tell those in charge, you know, this is what we think we need to do in order to alleviate this problem. Because so if somebody asked the question of what's the acceptable threshold for, for waterborne infections in Ireland, and from my perspective anyway, for a, a, a rich developed country like Ireland, there's really no excuse to have any waterborne cases of, of VTEC, right? Whatever about foodborne, a lot of them can't be helped, but from water, from from infrastructural perspective, we shouldn't have any waterborne associated um, cases of any infectious disease in, in, in Ireland, uh, I would think. And that's the goal that we should try work towards. So crucially, and I said this already, so the data really drives the, the effectiveness of the research um, and how meaningful it actually is. And we put a lot of time and effort into getting this first step right. Um, so it was a labor of love. And anybody who's had to, like the HSE, uh, working with academic partners, you know, it's, um, they're, they're different institutions and they're, they're, they're relationships you really have to mind. But we applied and we received access to the computerized infectious disease reporting system data. So this is all the notifiable infections that get reported from GPs or hospitals to the health service. Um, so we, we received the data for VTEC infections. Um, where we're primarily focused from the years 2013 to 17. Um, that is just because of changes in how uh, VTEC was actually um, diagnosed and changes in how we reported it and looking at cryptosporidiosis um, over a longer time period. So we have all that data. And then obviously, you know, we're not going to be working with individuals' health, like, like with GDPR and everything. We can't work specifically with people's case files. But you know, we can get it to a resolution that's still decent enough for research without compromising anybody's data protection. Um, so we worked with the, the Health uh, Protection Surveillance Centre and Colleen O'Hashida, who I heard was named, name dropped there a few minutes ago as well. We've worked intensively with him to get this to, you know, without losing any data, but having enough data to actually work with. So if you think of it, when a GP is reporting something, say I got a VTEC infection today and it was reported next week, it would say Gina DeWire, who lives in Carina and Limerick, whatever. We took all that information and we geocoded it uh, to census small areas. So this is the smallest kind of uh, resolution that we can go to without kind of breaching any data protection laws. Now, we don't map things to a house level, but we'll match, map it to the centroid of that small area. So there's, there's nearly 19,000 small areas in Ireland, and Ireland's a small country. So you get an appreciation you know, that we do have a fairly good resolution in terms of looking at what's happening where. So after doing all this, and I'll talk about it a bit more in a minute, um, by going through it, and this was a very iterative process of matching. You know, some addresses matched straight away. It was great. Uh, people who used air codes, there's a lot to be said for air codes, I might add, now that we're at the back end of this. So people that had air codes, obviously a very easy match. But then one of the challenges in Ireland is that, and you'll you know this from living here, there's a lot of like estates that recall the same name across the country and you know, a lot of house names that are the same, um, like Riverview and all this kind of thing. So it's quite tedious to, to match things. 
So we did uh, fuzzy string matching, uh, which was an automated process. And then we also did manual matching. So sometimes things could have been in Irish. And you know, just translating it to English gave you the exact um, the exact address, or there could be a typo you know, that was an obvious mistake that we were able to correct. So we ended up with data sets that had nearly 3,000 cases of VTEC and, and nearly 4,500 cases of cryptosporidium. So you're probably asking yourself here, that's a lot less than what's reported. We were only interested in primary cases of infection. Um, and that is because for things like VTEC, and as was alluded to earlier, Joe, you know, if a child gets a VTEC infection and it could very well have been from water, you send that child to creche, then suddenly you could have a creche outbreak. But all the kids in the creche are kind of a person to person transmission um, as opposed to the, the initial primary case, which, which potentially was waterborne. So we were only interested in primary cases so we could get a better idea of what actually caused it. Um, so this is what it, it boiled down to. So just, this is like, you can't even read this, it's just to give you an idea of, of what it looked like in terms of going through this step. So it took a very long time uh, to go through the data set, to pare it down, to get, to pull as much data as possible that we were confident was right. Um, so there was loads of different phases, some of it automated, a lot of it kind of manually, just making sure it was OK. But in the end of it, then we were able to produce, and this is the cryptosporidium data set just for um, show and tell. You know, we were able to actually geolink the cases as they occur in the country relative to small areas across the country. And once you have that data set then where you have a small area, you know, does it have a case of infection? Yes or no. And the details associated with that the world is your oyster then in terms of the things you can do in assessing you know, what, what potentially um, led to this small area having one or multiple infections. OK, so this is what we were working with from the get go. And we've now published this method. Um, so, again, like we don't like to do things you know, and hide them behind uh, hide them in our offices on our own computers. So like this is a published method now, and we'd encourage anyone who's working with CIDR data to follow it. Uh, so you know, that the results are comparable and you know, we have this standing up standard operating procedure uh, to actually work with infectious disease data. So it is a uh, high standard as we as we as we go on. But once we've had that data set now, we're asking ourselves kind of the basic questions, right? And the very first one is asking where are waterborne disease clusters in Ireland? And sure, this is a very basic question. And we know relatively, we know enough from kind of just looking at the data. You can go onto the HPSC website and look at the annual reports and you get an appreciation that some places are harder hit than others. others. But what we did was we made these space-time cluster maps um, and so you'll see here, obviously, the red, you have a higher incidence of infection, but this is both space and time. OK, so not only are we saying that you know, some areas have it you know, different, uh, some areas of the country are more susceptible to infection cases than others. But this is also looking at, is that like an anomaly? So you know, there's one year versus another or where, this is asking the question, where are the cases happening all the time? Uh, to put it very simply. And this is for cryptosporidiosis cases. And you can see there's three primary hotspots, really. OK, and it's the southwest and east of Limerick City, which is the Midwestern Health Board, uh, northeast of Galway um, and in around these areas. Notably, and this has been said already, Dublin, a lot of the like, so even you see Limerick City here is the black dot. You'll notice that there's there's no red around that. Cork City there in the south. We don't find a lot of the cases happening recurrently in the big urban areas, okay, or along maybe the less populous coastlines, right? So there's a very clear, I suppose, spatial distribution of disease uh, within the cryptosporidiosis data set. So we looked at this in terms of, Joe, putting a, uh, some numbers on it, just to point out here that it was statistically significant to say that this is a rural infection. Cryptosporidiosis is happening far more in rural areas than it is in urban areas. Again, to anyone kind of working in this area, not the biggest surprise in the world, but it's nice to kind of finally put a, a, a solid number on that, saying that Dublin isn't the problem here. OK, so we know with COVID and things like that, urban areas with population density were an issue. Um, but for these infections, which are long lingering, uh, we, it's very much a rural problem. And that's for myriad reasons, which we'll talk about later on. Similarly for VTEC, and this is the same story, but with VTEC, you'll notice that there's similar hotspots to cryptosporidium. All along the Shannon Basin here, we're seeing kind of high 
recurrence of infection um, in terms of the, the notification of VTEC cases. So just to make sure that you're aware, this is pointing out where it's happening kind of all the time. It's not pointing out every single VTEC case in the country. But again, an interesting observation, Joe, that these two waterborne associated diseases by and large are happening in and around the same areas. And similar to the cryptosporidium data set, and we've known this for quite a while, a rural bias in terms of actual occurrence of, of VTEC um, within, the, within the Irish state anyway. We also want to look at when are these waterborne diseases cases happening? And again, you know, this is something that we have an idea about, but it's interesting to know. And from an epidemiological perspective, it gives us a good bit of insight as to not only when we should show uh, enact different management practices, but show what is the what is the actual activities that are driving it. And if we look at cryptosporidium, so this is all the cases from 20, or 2008 to 2017, you'll see you have this spring summer kind of bias. Now, cryptosporidium is a, is a difficult one because anyone who's familiar with the actual microorganism, the cryptosporidium oozes, they're extremely hardy. They can survive in the environment for quite a long time. Um, so they're not as, I suppose, cut and dry as, as VTEC cases. But we definitely have this seasonality to cryptosporidiosis infections, whereby in the spring and the summer, more so in, as we get into late spring, early summer, we see a very clear increase in the number of cases nationally. Uh, so this tells us, Joe, not only is it potentially affected by things like meteorology, but it also links it, I suppose, to activities that tend to also have a temporal nature. Things like agriculture, Joe, you have potentially cattle in and out, um, out in the fields at some stages in the year and housed inside at others. So a similar case arises when we look at VTEC. Um, so looking at the distribution again, and VTEC is a little bit more complicated, I suppose, uh, from some perspectives, especially if you think about cryptosporidium, there's loads of different types of cryptosporidium, but cryptosporidium parvum and cryptosporidium hominis are the two main infectious agents that we're worried about from a public health perspective. But we actually just report cryptosporidium. We don't, um, we don't delineate between the, the, the zero groups. But when we look at VTEC, there's many different types of VTEC. Um, and in Ireland, we have the two primary ones are ones called VTEC 0157 and VTEC 026. So historically, VTEC 0157 was the predominant zero group or zero type of VTEC that was reported. And in the last number of years, we've had a shift where 026 has kind of taken over a little bit. But if we look at it across, I suppose, temporarily, We'll see, we see that VTEC cases also have a bit of a seasonality to it, where we see higher cases in the summer leading into autumn. If we look at this across the, the zero groups and we look at 026 here on, on my left, you'll see that you have an earlier kind of peak. So the 026 infections, I suppose, show themselves from April onwards and tend to alleviate a little bit of October. And when we look at 0157, we see a much a later kind of um, development of infection from July onwards and kind of dragging out a little bit into November. So all isn't really created equal in terms of you know, the, the temporal distribution of, of these infections. But again, important information to know in terms of preparing for, for healthcare services and things like that, or again, when to enact specific management procedures to try um, reduce the burden of disease in places that we saw in the aforementioned maps um, at different times of the year. So as with all kind of environmental infections, so it's generally not a case, it's not like COVID, so you could say wear the mask, there's this blanket approach to things. These things are, are very specific to, to where you are. And as we see, can also be quite specific to what time of year it actually is. So the, the health, I suppose, response to it in terms of policy won't be this blanket uh, approach, it should be bespoke to, to where you are and what the current risk is in terms of the epidemiology of the infections. So we're also interested in looking at, you know, is there any kind of anomalies? So what we did was this is a residual analysis and these are kind of confusing, so I don't want to confuse you. But essentially what we're looking for is very like large deviations from what we would consider the, the normal kind of background levels of infection. So this is for VTEC going back through the years and you see it's up and down or whatever. And then similarly for, for cryptosporidium, we see the same kind of story. But from our perspective, looking at this, Joe, we noticed that there was these peaks here for both infections in 2016. 
And this is the benefit, I suppose, of working in an, a multidisciplinary group. You know, we asked ourselves, like, what in the name of God like, would have caused that? Because it was quite a, a significant uptick in terms of infection. And we started thinking about what was happening in the world at that time. And it kind of dawned on us that if everybody remembers, back in very late 2015, edging into the start of 2016, the weather in Ireland was bonkers, right? And we had these three big storms. So we wanted to see, was this an event-based response? So we have these background levels of infection, you know, that ebb and flow with the seasonality and across the different health boards. But this is a clear, like, moving away from the, the background trend. So, Joe, was this caused by an event? And generally, if you do have a big change or something, something caused it. So we, we wanted to investigate that. And our best bet was looking at, considering what we knew about where the cases were, um, and Joe, you know, the temporality that it's likely associated with things like meteorology, we looked more into these big storms. So there was three very big storms around the time, um, and there was really significant flooding events. So this is just um, three maps of the three storms that, that took place in late 2015, early 2016. And the Shannon Basin here is, is in, the, in the kind of the, the grey outline. And you see here, you know, the little red dots are the highest flood record recorded, or the orange is the second highest and, and back and forth. Right. So what we know is during that event, uh, the couple of months, you know, we had this significant burden of flooding uh, within the country. And Ireland is a nation that floods. You know, we know this. Um, but again, long, if we're thinking into the future in terms of things like climate change, you know, that's projected to get a bit worse. So it's important that we know um, or quantify to some intelligible level that you know, flooding has an impact on, on public health that we actually see in our, in our infection data. So very high levels of flooding all along the Shannon Basin and other parts of the country. But because of what we knew about where the diseases were happening, Joe, the Shannon Basin was something that um, was really stood out to us as potentially an issue. So what we did was we looked at the infections after in and around the floods. And what you found was that, so this is here, we have VTEC and Cryptosporidium again. And you can see that there was very obvious clusters of infection following this flood. And depending on the infection, it was actually quite a long lag, um, up to 12 to 13, 14 weeks after the flooding event. And to, you know, to, to people who aren't hydrolo hydrologists, that might make absolutely no sense. And you're going, you're, you're probably stretching a bit there, Gene. But when you understand the hydrological uh, system with Ireland and the interactions between surface and groundwater and things like that, so you can have this very long lag of time before an infection actually makes its way through the environment and reaches a receptor, which results then in, in a case, also taking into account incubation periods and things like that. So I haven't got the exact statistics and I'll, I'll show you the paper at the end, um, but we found a, a statistically significant link between infection cases that seem to be associated with these big flood events in Ireland. So that tells us you know, that there's this definitive link between this environmental phenomenon, i.e. flooding, and a public health outcome, i.e. infectious disease notifications. So now we know where they're happening, kind of when they're happening, and we know that, they're, that infections are actually responsive to, to different events, so be it things like flooding, um, so we have less information on things like droughts, but uh, there's a very clear case for, for concern to a, a large extent here. So we have an idea of where and when, but so crucially, we want to know why. Because um, again, it's not enough to say it when it floods, you get infectious diseases. So we really want to understand why or why we're getting infectious diseases in and around the Midwest and not in the East or, or what have you. So we've been talking about this for a while. And that dad, the lo lovely data sets we have now, we we've linked them with anything that you can link into really, um, but largely from an environmental perspective. So looking at what we know, you know and actually forming hypotheses that, are, that stand to reason. So we've linked all the different affections, things like cattle density, sheep density, uh, infrastructural things like septic tanks, uh, using private wells, anything you can imagine, hydrogeology, weather, uh, loads of different things. And we're working through this data in some of our projects at the moment. But we did publish a paper a few years ago, um, which was looking specifically at VTEC because it's, um, you know, it's such an obvious one to look at. And we found by linking the data, linking VTEC infection, um, this is specifically VTEC 0157, but we did 026 as well. 
by linking the data, looking at it relative to things that we had a kind of a, a good idea were potentially impacting cases and notifications. We found that wells per head of population, and that's private wells, which was said already, if you use a private well in this country, you're over 15 times more likely to contract a VTEC 0157 infection. And that's a lot, really, when we think about it, 15 times more likely. Uh, it's also associated with cattle density. And if we go back to the source transport receptor model, what we have here is that cattle are very likely the source. We have a dominance of cattle in Ireland. And then where you have cattle, tends to be in rural areas. In rural areas, you also then have a reliance on private wells. So it's this perfect storm in terms of the source transport receptor pathway. Um, and you know, once you understand that, it becomes very obvious why we have the highest um, incidence of the infection within the EU. So there was other things that we included, like septic tank density, which we, were, we thought that they might bear out in the data, but they didn't. Um, we looked at things like um, the, the deprivation score, Again, we thought that might bear out. We have another project looking at this in far more detail, which I don't really talk about today. But you know, generally, if we think about uh, VTEC infections, it's um, in a lot of ways, you, know, you might think of it as associated with deprivation, but in a lot of ways, it can be associated with affluence. So I know from my own perspective, when I'm out in the field, a lot of the houses that I'm working at looking for different um, infectious diseases in groundwater, but they're not living in, in, in deprived households. They're often in these detached five-bedroom Belfast sink households, you know, from the, the last boom where people moved out of the cities and their water is then, you know, not safe to drink. So we have it in our heads that it can be associated with deprivation to some extent, but in a lot of ways it's associated with affluence as well. Um, and we see that in urban areas in terms of the foodborne um, infections uh, related to VTEC too. So again, crucially, and like this is something that we're, we're quite passionate about, we know from a disease perspective, Joe, that we have this association with VTEC cases and private wells, and Joe, it's statistically robust, it's statistically significant, we're fairly confident. Um, but at the back end of that then is you want to be able to say for certain, because Joe, rural Ireland has a lot of the same characteristics, Joe, there is agriculture, there is septic tanks, there are wells, so you have to be careful that you're not I suppose that wells aren't a, a proxy for something else. OK, very unlikely, but so you have to be sure of that. So we like to look at things from bottom up, OK, which is confirming the why. So if we're saying that we think that if you have a private well, you're more likely to get VTEC, then surely to God, you should be able to find VTEC in those wells. Uh, it stands to reason from a, from a scientific perspective. So that's what we did, really. We went out to, to see if, if we could actually find it. And we're, we're most interested in, in terms of water, in groundwater, okay, because the public water supply is treated to a fairly high, very high standard, although Irish water have been in the news recently because mistakes do happen, but generally it's groundwater that we're concerned with and these private wells, because from an EU perspective, the EU drinking water governs water quality or drinking water quality in Ireland. But if you read the European Drinking Water Directive, there's a little notation that says supplies that serve less than 50 people are exempt. All right, so unless you have a, a crazy big household, if you're using a private well, you're completely exempt from the European Drinking Water uh, Directive, which means the quality of that water is, is, is nobody's concern but yours, really. Um, so it's up to the household uh, user to, to have information about it. So I will say, as somebody who works a lot with groundwater, Groundwater is by and large much cleaner than surface water. We know this from just a basic perspective. Joe, you know, it's, it's under the ground, it's covered by different soil layers, it's protected by rock, generally much higher quality, all, almost always much higher quality than surface water. But water quality issues still exist. Um, and microbiological contamination. Jean, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you wrap up in the next few minutes? Um, I'd just like to leave time for questions and for the next yeah, few yeah. minutes. No problem. Yeah, so in Ireland, about 26% of our supplies are coming from these groundwater sources, you know, so it's, um, it's a lot of the resources in Ireland and it's around three quarters of a million people. So when we're looking at it in terms of Look, the monitoring data, um, and this is from the EPA's monitoring data set, you know, they take a lot of samples and we're able to investigate then if there is E. coli within those samples. So just to speed it up a little, we looked at the EPA's monitoring data set and we found that 
So nearly 70% of them had E. coli at least once. And the seasonal patterns kind of mimic that that we saw in the infectious disease data set. But this is using E. coli as an indicator. So basic E. coli, as opposed to looking at infectious diseases. But again, if we do a hotspot kind of analysis, we do see a kind of a similar trend to the infectious disease data. And we see that there's differences based on hydrogeology as when um, infection actually arises or when we get cases of E. coli within groundwater, this higher frequency in autumn and summer. OK, but we wanted to do one step further then, and I'm nearly done, don't worry. Uh, looking, are there pathogens in groundwater? So through the EPA design project, we looked to see if there was VTEC in groundwater wells that were used for drinking water by people. And we found that 43% of them contained virotoxin genes. So that tells us at some stage there was VTEC present within that well. So the line between research and the infectious disease data becomes quite clear. And we were able to detect 0157, which is the most prevalent um, infectious disease. So just to kind of, I suppose, wrap it up in terms of what we know, you know, we know quite a bit in Ireland um, in terms of the source transport receptor. So there's not a lot, there's, there's still questions to answer, but you know, we know quite a bit. Everything that I've talked about here is published, um, especially over the last number of years, we've published quite significantly, you're free to look at them. And just in terms of where to now, Joe, we need to better understand now how we actually manage this, um, especially in terms of agriculture and environmental management strategies to prevent the, the microbiological loading in natural waters, including groundwater. We need to protect private well owners and we need very stringent guidelines on what they should do. And one of the ones that I'm particularly interested in is just educating people, um, Joe, so that they become stewards of their own health especially for the private well users so who are largely not covered by any governmental legislation. So it's kind of up to themselves to make sure that they're protected. And when people do know there's a problem, generally they, they want to, to, to protect their health and they take action. Right, so that's it for me. Sorry for increasing speed there at the end. There's my email address and Paul's. And then just a thank you to all the, the funders who have funded this research over the last number of years. Okay, I'll stop sharing and come back to you. Uh, thanks so much, Jean. Um, that was really fascinating. And uh, it's a real shame, I think, that we um, we have to speed you up at the end. But I'm just conscious that we should get to the, the next speaker. So if you don't mind, Jean, I might um, just move on to uh, Bernie and Darren uh, next. And I'm going to take questions then um, at the end. But I think just to, to bear with me, I think there was one interesting um, uh, point around having access to the geo directory and I know you mentioned air code so we might come back to a discussion at the end around sort of access to data and what would enhance I suppose all of our research agendas so maybe just keep that uh, in mind so um, with that I'd like to introduce our um, final speakers uh, for uh, this morning and um, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Darren Clark um, from DCU um, and his colleague Bernie O'Donoghue Donoghue Hines from the LGMA um, who are going to speak about their work um, on climate action key performance indicators. So um, I think it's Darren first and then Bernie. So um, I'll hand yeah. over to you. Thanks, Anne. Um, I hope everybody can hear me OK. Um, so yep. thanks again for the opportunity to talk. Um, Bernie and I have worked uh, together in the past, and uh, this, this relates to uh, a small piece of research I did for the local government sector uh, and work that Bernie is involved with, with the local government sector uh, uh, presently. So um, I'm going to present the first half and Bernie the second half. And it's basically looking at the role of evidence to inform uh, the development of climate action key performance indicators within the local government sector. So uh, I was asked or tasked to undertake a literature review uh, earlier this year um, as part of this project. And as I said, Bernie will talk about the implementation of this uh, within the local government sector in the second half. So I'll talk very briefly for about uh, seven or eight minutes and, and then pass it over to Bernie. Uh, so uh, as I said, I'm, uh, or as Anne said, I'm a lecturer in, in the School of History and Geography in, uh, in Dublin City University and have actually worked with the local government sector in the past uh, alongside Bernie. So the background to this project is uh, local authorities were committed to monitor, evaluate and report annually on the implementation of activities contained in the local authority climate action charter. And the uh, local government management agency uh, identified a small piece of research to 
look at developing key performance indicators, climate action indicators for the sector. And there were five primary goals with this, um, looking at the extensive work that has taken place to date in the area of climate action, including policy developments nationally and internationally, identifying national and international best practice regarding the development of climate action KPIs, looking at the development of climate action KPIs across jurisdictions, uh, and then supporting the selection of KPIs and informing the future development of KPIs, aligning to key areas of work that the local government sector in Ireland is responsible for, including the uh, local authority climate action charter, the climate action plan from 2019, and a strategy that the local government sector published recently delivering effective climate action 2030. And then goal five, looking at the opportunities for the alignment of uh, identified KPIs to those being developed in other jurisdictions. So uh, as part of this research, uh, I, I was obviously responsible for the literature review component, coming up with uh, identifying indicators for the sector. And that involved looking at uh, the exciting part of looking at uh, about 300 uh, academic articles uh, in various academic databases, uh, which you can see there. Uh, and also because a lot of uh, KPIs or key performance indicators uh, have been developed by municipal authorities, by uh, local authorities outside of Ireland, it also involved looking at local government websites internationally and other relevant websites which show climate action performance indicators or metrics that are specifically relevant to local government. So in terms of goal one, these five goals that I talked about, uh, setting the international and, and national context regarding uh, climate action KPIs. Uh, at a national level, more generally, uh, you can see the key pieces of policy and legislation there that have uh, informed climate action planning uh, nationally, including uh, more recently, the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act uh, and the Climate Action Plan, which is due for update uh, towards the end of this year, early next year as well. Uh, at, a, at a sector level, at a local government sector level, though, uh, there are a few additional policies that the local government sector uh, has responsibility for when it comes to climate, climate change, including that local authority climate action charter that I've mentioned already and the National Adaptation Framework. And local authorities have also developed uh, adaptation plans, uh, 31 local authority adaptation plans for each of the individual local authorities uh, in the last year or so. In terms of goal two, um, unsurprisingly with uh, key performance indicators, uh, the uh, identifying best practice regarding the development of not just key performance indicators for climate action, but uh, more generally uh, key performance indicators in general uh, and these include simple things like setting clear goals so that everyone knows what you're measuring, um, making sure that there's institutional buy-in across all levels of the organization from senior management uh, right down to uh, clerical officers or whatever, uh, whatever level, lowest level might be or the, the most junior level in an organization might be. Uh, and that links into then um, mainstreaming and making sure that uh, not just uh, that this is uh, seen as a, a senior management role uh, or it's seen as a responsibility, a performance metric is seen as a responsibility for a particular functional area that it's seen as everyone's responsibility within an organization. And that was key from the, the key findings of the literature review in terms of identifying best practice. And that stakeholder support and engagement was evident in terms of both internal stakeholder support. For example, in this case, uh, local authority or local uh, councillors, for example, internal support, and then external support and engagement as well with the likes of community groups, with the likes of businesses, with the likes of uh, civic society organisations as well. Uh, and that there's clear benchmarks and baseline periods so that uh, when we're measuring these things, we know what we're measuring them against and at what time periods we're, we're comparing. And lastly, but uh, probably most importantly, that the indicators themselves are simple. So this would apply to any indicator, whether it's climate change or not. But again, the literature just reaffirmed this uh, aspect. In terms of goal three, um, comparing the development of climate action KPIs across jurisdictions, I suppose local authorities in Ireland are unique uh, relative to the European counterparts that they typically have much lower control over um, mitigation and adaptation planning and the targets than is available 
where it's much less decentralized in other European countries. So uh, slightly unique, uh, the Irish context is slightly unique uh, in terms of centralization of local authority responsibilities, including in climate change. Um, but broadly speaking, KPIs uh, aligned in the literature, at least uh, in other jurisdictions to mitigation or adaptation. So that leads me on to goal four and the sector, the local government sector, uh, including uh, work that Bernie had been involved in prior to me undertaking this work, uh, highlighted the importance of mainstreaming across uh, the local government sector for any indicators. And they identified kind of four key areas that would be relevant to identify metrics across, including the obvious mitigation and adaptation and internal behavior change and capacity building, and then community capacity building and citizen engagement. So Broadly speaking, not dissimilar to uh, what uh, I've, I've talked about uh, in terms of the development of key performance indicators and, and the metrics that are used, ensuring you have uh, institutional buy-in and so on as well. So there are the four themes uh, around which the literature review was kind of framed. And so goal five, the final goal looked at um, looking at the opportunities for aligning the uh, KPIs to those being developed in other jurisdictions. So there were 60 climate action KPIs developed from the literature, uh, 36 of these specifically related to mitigation, nine to adaptation and 15 to uh, combined mitigation and adaptation because the boundaries between what's mitigation and adaptation is sometimes a little blurred. Um, and we only focused on outcome indicators and to give a, a clarification on what an outcome indicator is, typically speaking, um, when we're developing KPIs, there's usually process indicators, which are making sure we have the systems in place uh, to actually measure what we want to measure in quantitative terms. So, for example, uh, binary responses like yes, no responses would be a process indicator. Do you have a climate action team in place would be a, a process indicator. And then an outcome indicator would be much more quantitative measure of uh, the number of actions or the percentage change and so on. And we only focused on outcome indicators for this study, primarily because uh, we had completed a significant piece of work, uh, research for the sector uh, in 2020, that a large part of it looked actually at identifying uh, what process, processes were in place, including process indicators. So it was outcome indicators we focused on in this study. Uh, and there is a report already done on the uh, looking at the, the systems and processes in place that the sector has already developed. Um, in terms of the KPIs, there were 14 broad themes aligned to kind of the, the key functional areas that local authorities are responsible for. And like I said, these outcome indicators are much more quantitative in terms of they look at giving a unit of measurement, uh, a suggested baseline year, potential data source from where the data might be derived from and how you might actually gather it for the sector and a time frame, whether it's short term, easy to gather within a year, medium term, kind of one to three years, or longer term, kind of three, three years and beyond that it would take to collect the data. And just very lastly, before I hand over to Bernie, um, this is just a snapshot. Uh, this report has been published and it's available on the local government management agency website, but just a snapshot of some of the measures that you can see uh, of the 60 that were identified. Um, for example, you can see the first one there is looking at the percentage change in fertilizer use by councils annually, uh, and the unit is measured there, and where the source of the, the information came from, the liter literature review. Just lastly, just to, in terms of overall recommendations, uh, the report or the, the literature review piece highlighted that KPIs uh, identified the 60 we're basically a starting point for the sector. So it's useful as a starting point, but by no means a, a finalized list that should be considered uh, for the next decade and beyond. Uh, and particularly conscious that no weighting was assigned as to the importance of any of the 60 indicators, because the sector is uh, needs to consider what's realistic, necessary and ambitious, but at least provides them with a starting point as to where they should look at what they should measure. Uh, and periodic reviews, like I mentioned, should be undertaken regularly to update the indicators based on rapidly changing climate action policy. And that is uh, pretty rapid at the minute and will likely change over the coming uh, coming uh, decade or so. But uh, like the report highlighted, it needs to be equally ambitious based on existing, likely onerous policy and legislative commitments being placed on the sector. So I'll leave it at that and uh, pass it over to Bernie, who will continue on. 
Um, hi, how are you? Um, so I suppose I'm moving on to look at, I suppose, the more practical side of things. So we had a task, we were charged with developing a set of KPIs for the sector. So this looks at how we use the evidence that was contained in Darren's Lit Review to inform our work. And the presentation really focuses a lot on the current processes and the current indicators that we identified and the systems we've identified to update and renew the KPIs as we move forward. So I'll start by looking at the key stakeholders. Now, this relates, I suppose, to the principle that Darren talked about around institutional buy-in and to some extent, stakeholder support and engagement. So we start with 31 local authorities. Now, every local authority works individually they respond to their own local needs, local needs, and they're responsible for reporting in on their own actions. Um, they're, they're, they are not um, one homogenous group, and the the delivery of I suppose delivery of policy at an implementation level. Um, um, okay, so you've 31 individual local authorities all reporting on their own actions. Now there is sectoral representation under the, the CCMA. Now the CCMA is where the 31 local um, chief executives plus the five assistant chief executives in Dublin come together. And they operate under seven committees. Now, one of these seven committees is the Climate Action Networks and Transportation Committee. And they have assumed a very strong leadership role in trying to give the sector a common vision and um, I suppose a focal point for developing the KPIs. And the other stakeholder then is the LGMA. Now, while the CCMA is an association of those stakeholders, of those key chief executives, the LGMA is an agency and the role of the LGMA is to support the CCMA. Um, one, 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 of the, one of the resources is to provide technical assistance in this instance through the research unit. But one of the key things is the LGMA manage a central data collection tool called LG Returns. And it's typically um, used when there is a requirement to gather data across the sector. Um, so that's been quite useful in this instance. Now, the other really important key, key stakeholders in, in within this um, cohort are the four CARA offices. Now, these are the Climate Action Regional Offices. They provide advice and assistance to local authorities within each of their areas, but they have a key role to play in terms of advocacy and liaising directly with the local authorities to try and roll out the system around climate action KPIs. Now, all those actors came together and we formed a working group. Um, Sorry, the clickers and work over here very well. Um, so we have a climate action working group and we pulled stakeholders together from these four um, key groups and we report directly back into the, the CCMA Climate Action Committee. So we're really, we have uh, membership from direct delivery on the ground, reporting right up to a senior level to the chief executive level. Um, so well, after we look then at the key stakeholders, what we'd have to look at then is this idea of what is the responsibility of local authorities. Darren has pointed out that local authorities operate completely differently in Ireland versus European um, or European counterparts, where there are more municipalities and they have a lot of influence over policy making and so on. In Ireland, we're more policy takers than policy makers. So the, the requirement for us to monitor act, our activities um, really comes out of the charter. And if we look at what they're asking for, what they're saying is that we need to focus in on our leadership role. So leading by example, uh, is your own house in order first? So how do we manage the resources that local authorities are responsible for? And also to report on the implementation of the activities that each local authority has identified it will deliver on and track those and report on them. So from there, then we look at when we're developing the KPIs is policy alignment. Um, Darren identified the five thematic areas that we'd be identifying KPIs under. Um, and now they align to the national policy around climate action charter and the climate action plan. But they also align importantly to this delivering effective climate action 2030. Now, this is a sectoral vision. 
Now, there aren't many policy areas um, that local authorities work on where they have come together as a unit themselves, the 31 local authorities, to identify what their vision is. Because this is a new policy area, local authorities have taken a big, big leadership role here and identified what the vision is. And the thematic areas we've identified feed, feed into the DECA 2030 um, strategy and vision, as well as the national policies. But really importantly, they also align very directly directly into the work plans for the CAROs. So we have alignment of our themes at a policy level, but also at an operational level. So what it's going to look like on the ground. Now, before we started looking at the, the specific KPIs, um, now we adapted a lot of the principles that Darren has talked about. Now, he mentioned his list of indicators being predominantly around outcome indicators. But for us, because we're in the infancy, so the early part of the life cycle, it was really important for us to focus on process indicators as well. So this is about establishing that the infrastructure actually exists across the sector to track the indicators um, that we need to track and to ensure that um, delivery is possible through the appropriate inf infrastructure across the sector. And this is really important given that you're dealing with 31 different local authorities, all with independence around how they delivered it, it in many instances. Um, we also acknowledged absolutely that there would be a focus on mitigation as well as adaptation, and this is um, really feeding down from policy at the national level. But really important to us is this concept of simplicity and ease of collection. We're gathering data from 31 separate organizations, and we know from experience with other um, indicator collections, principally NOAC, which is the Natural Over National Oversight and Audit Commission, they gather performance indicators across the sector, across all themes every year. And we know that if, we're, if the data we're collecting isn't simple and easy to gather, it has a huge impact on rates of response and data quality. So that was a major, major consideration for us. And then the last thing was to look at who's already doing the data collection. As I mentioned, NOAC. Now, they have um, uh, two or three indicators that they already gather in relation to climate action. So we wanted to make sure that we we're just adding to that and complementing it. But we're also keeping them informed about the work we're doing so that um, they so we can feed each other and ensure that um, developments going forward match. Now, when we moved on then to look at exactly what we would actually look, um, collect within the sector, these are the kind of, um, um, I suppose, actions and, and indicators we're looking at. So under the concept of mainstreaming, so th what we wanted to do here is that we wanted to look to see where are local authorities um, allocating resources to dedicated resources in each of the 31 local authorities to address climate action. But at the same time, did they have structures in place like cross departmental th teams that would involve people from every aspect of service delivery in local authorities and assume responsibility for climate action um, and climate change, um, I beg your pardon, climate change um, uh, initiatives. Sorry, the slide, I didn't mean the slide to move on there. And now, like what we have to acknowledge is at this point in the de development of the indicators, some of them are ready to go because we've worked with the sector already to identify the indicators and the, the, the data is there and ready to go. There are other areas where we're saying it's an area we want to look at um, very soon, but we're just not quite ready to. And one of the areas that here under mainstream is rem green procurement. Now, under um, mitigation, we're looking at existing indicators being collected by NOAC, the first one in relation to energy saving indicators. Now, this is an area where targets are set for us at a national level. So here we're very much policy takers, but we are monitoring the energy savings as required at a national level. And then we did work at NOAC last year to identify um, a sub indicator really around public lights. And the reason we focus in on this is that public lighting accounts for up to 50% of energy consumption for most local authorities. So uh, as, as, as a big, big initiative like that, it's worthy of direct um, monitoring and tracking and, and, and valuation and reporting on. So we do that with NOAC. And in the future, and this is once again, um, once we have guidance at a national level, we will look at the admissions side of things. 
Now, under the internal behaviour and change, and um, I suppose the talk that Shane did earlier on was very, very interesting um, because we are looking at the area of behavioural change here. What we needed to look at here were major initiatives that were happening across the sector, but happening for every single local authority. Um, now, as it happens, the local authority services and national training group, they have developed a very comprehensive set of training modules um, that will be rolled out across the sector. Now, this is training that will be administered to 30,000 um, employees in excess of 30,000 employees and to almost 1,000 um, elected members. So it's a very, very nice indicator for us, but we're very fortunate that there was work already being progressed across the sector, um, bringing all local authorities together and all human resource departments tracking this with the support of the CAROs. Then when we go on to move at ad adaptation there, now under adaptation, each local authority has their own climate um, action plan or climate change adaptation strategy. And there's a list of actions that every local authority had to name. And then the idea is that while we know every local authority is going to deliver a different set of actions to respond to their local needs, what we could do here was track the levels of progress um, under those specific actions. And the last um, in the last thematic area is a complex area, and it's back to this behavioral change and capacity building. We do have an existing indicator under NOAC that tracks um, the number of schools involved in the Green Schools Initiative. Um, but this is an area that we're not ready to look at yet, because what we have to do is look at identifying major initiatives that would be taking place across all local authorities. But that's um, on our to do list and um, something we'll work with the local authorities on going forward. Now, once we'd identified those set of indicators, and even though they seem quite simple, it actually took quite a bit of time to develop them. Um, what, what we needed to do then was test the feasibility of collecting this data across the sector, because while we manage the central tool, it is a manual data entry system. So we, um, we used our LG return system, but there were four local authorities on the working group, and we worked with them to pilot the data collection. Um, so once we had um, the pie in place, what we did is we, we, we gathered the information and then we developed a very, very detailed guidance document that will accompany the data request going out. And this is to make sure that there's no mi misinterpretation of data because there were very practical things that came up when we asked uh, questions like a full-time equivalent, um, like what did that mean in different local authorities? So there was a lot, there were a lot of basic issues to be sorted out like that. And that was addressed through the guidance document. So these are the specific questions that we asked. Um, so under mainstreaming, how many full-time equivalent climate um, action officers were in place? Now, the target here is that every local authority would have one. And then we asked about cross-departmental te te teams and the number of meetings and the average membership. And here we're trying to get a sense of how many various departments across local authorities were involved in these cross-departmental teams. Um, but then we also looked to find out of those, how many of the members had completed the training, because it's really important that people involved are actually fully informed and understand the full implication of the actions they're engaging with. And then because if we just looked at the climate action teams, every local authority can have one. But what we wanted is a sense of activity. So in a very, very large um, local authority, would it, we would expect to see a large number of subgroups. So by asking this set of questions, we get a sense of whether there are dedicated resources and whether to complement that, that there's cross-departmental fertilization. And then... Um, some sense of activity um, when we look at a small versus a large local authority. Um, when we look at behavioural change here and capacity building, um, so we ask then, and we track this through the HR departments in each of the local authorities, how many of the elected members have completed their climate action training? And we asked for the total number of members in each local authority so we can calculate the, the percentage. And then we do the same thing around the staff. So how many people have completed the training? How many people do we have in total? And then what's our percentage? So the target in both these groups is 100%. Um, so as you can see, with an initiative like this, this kind of KPI, it may be relevant for a period of time and they may have no more relevance and then we look at identifying a different indicator under that theme. theme. Um, and when we look at adaptation, now here each local authority, as I say, has a list of actions that it has committed to, uh, to deliver on. 
So what we're asking is what stage of completion are they all at? And this allows us to develop this kind of a matrix where we can say of each local authority, how many actions they have and whether they're completed or work in progress, whether they have to be postponed, um, whether they're not going to start and whether new actions have to be brought in instead. And um, so there are the questions we asked and we there are the questions we used for the pilot. But after we'd done that, we needed to go back to the CCMA and say, OK, look, at the, we've done that. We know it works. Now we need to tie down exactly who's going to monitor this on an ongoing basis going forward, because the research advisory group was only set up for a particular period of time. Who's going to collect and prepare the annual report and what processes are going to be put in place for ongoing review and revision? And this was actually what was agreed then by the CCMA um, CATN committee. So the data would be collected annually. Um, now, it'll be collected in the February or March um, for the previous year. But we will have a once off collection at the end of this year to capture information for 2020. And we're going to use that then as our baseline year. Now, these are all, I suppose, um, uh, uh, features that had been identified in the lit review that should exist within the system. It was um, um, uh, decided then that the KPI working group would need to stay in place on a permanent basis. Um, they would be the ones responsible for carrying out the analytics and they would bring this information back into the Climate Action KPI um, or the Climate Action um, Committee because there's no point gathering this information, as Darren had said, unless it's going to feed back into some system that's going to take responsibility for effecting change on foot of the results. And the submission date will be May each year, but as NOAC gathers some of the, the indicators and they're not reported till September, we would resubmit then towards the end of the year in case there's any additional data that would be relevant. And that the CATN um, committee would not just review the results, they would also take on responsibility then for reviewing each of the indicators to determine whether they're relevant and to look at the list of indicators that Darren has produced in the climate action um, lit review and to see whether any of them would be relevant for us going forward. So that's the end of the presentation. I thank you very much for listening. Um, and if anybody has any questions, myself and Darren are more than happy to take them now. Great, thank you so much, Bernie um, and Darren. Um, so we've got about um, seven or eight minutes um, to sort of wrap up questions. So um, I don't know whether we have any specific questions in just yet for um, Bernie and Darren, but I might just pick up on one um, sort of theme I think that you were talking about, and I suppose it, it might a broader relevance, I suppose, for what we've been talking about this morning. Um, so you mentioned that sort of um, tension in designing and choosing the indicators between, yeah. I suppose, local government, local authorities and local government's role as sort of policy makers versus policy takers. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, could you expand on that a little bit? Because I suppose, you know, what we've been talking about this morning sort of is predicated on the assumption, you know, that, um, you know, these the policymakers or the appropriate um, authorities have the have the responsibility to, to take action here. So um, maybe you could just expand on that a little. Yeah, I suppose local authorities are in Ireland are in a very kind of strange space. Um, like across Europe, they would be municipalities and they would have a lot of influence um, over, um, I suppose, influence over a wide breadth of policies because they take responsibility around health and education, social care and so on. Um, Ireland, it's much more siloed. So we kind of have our foot in, in, in kind of, we're seen by people on the ground as being part of the system, yet we don't belong to a government department. We're separate um, and we are responsible for delivery. So while we aren't policy makers, we have huge capacity for policy influence. So typically local authorities have been very, very poor at gathering information and using evidence. Um, like anecdotal evidence has been used quite a bit to try and inform policy to date. So the role of the LGMA, LGMA now working with, the, with the, the CCMA, the City and County Management Association, is to move towards a model where we start gathering our own data at a sectoral level to produce our own evidence that we will use with an informed view of how we now feel policy should be influenced. So we're trying to formalize our role in terms of where we sit on the policy infrastructure. 
Um, so frequently, um, the, the way things tend to happen, I suppose, with local government and um, national government is that we respond to data requests as we're asked for them, as opposed to being proactive about trying to identify what is it the sector needs to know. Now, us taking um, responsibility here in this instance about developing the climate action indicators we think are appropriate to the sector is a real sign that local authorities aren't sitting back and just saying, okay, here's the policy, here's what you've delivered, just do that and report back in, local authority by local authority. Um, the local authorities are coming together to say, OK, we'll do that, but we'll pull the data together ourselves first, comment on it, um, align it to a vision that we've already developed and feed it back into the department with the commentary and with a view on what that indicator actually means. So it is, it's, it's quite a big development, really, um, in terms of how local authorities are going to engage with various government departments in relation to policy, because it's not the way it's necessarily done in other areas. And I think it's been a really interesting um, learning because this is such a new policy area. Um, like we did have an opportunity some years ago around early childhood education and care because that was another brand new policy area. But local authorities were very much to the side, just involved in the infrastructural side, but not the policy side. Um, but we're, we're front and centre here around our responsibility because we're responsible for planning, biodiversity um, and a whole range of things that impact on our core work. So it's just an interesting time and it's interesting to see the impact it may have on how policy develops going forward. Great. Uh, thanks, Bernie. So we have a couple um, of additional questions now. So I might take some time and, and go through those if people will bear with me for a few extra minutes. I write, might run a, about five minutes over. So um, one here from uh, Jonathan at the EPA, local government has a powerful opportunity to bring the voice of citizens to the national table. To what extent are the PPNs, um, et cetera, involved in the local climate policy engagement model? Um, so you might expand on that. Um, OK, I suppose the, the focus on this presentation hasn't been on that piece. Now, that's really like the, the that really involves in the theme that we identified around our external focus on behavioral change and engagement and so on. And that's an area that we haven't started gathering the data on yet. Now, each local authority um, and the four CAROs are actively out there involved in consultation and engaging with a variety of community um, organizations quite frequently through the PPNs. And also I need to acknowledge that the PPNs under every local authority operate differently. Um, some of them are within the local authority, um, but some of them are separate organizations. So we have to acknowledge that landscape as well. So we're only in our infancy and in terms of trying to gather information about how much engagement is happening there, but there is a huge amount happening. But look, at we've already started trying to gather that, that kind of engagement data around another initiative under the COVID-19 community call Keep Well campaign. And it's a very complicated area because you're trying to track things like events, um, consultations and so on, and, and which stakeholders are involved. And when you're dealing with 31 local authorities that are frequently dealing with thousands of events and thousands of stakeholders, the data collection around that element is very, very, very complex. And we were very fortunate when we were looking at the internal piece that there happened to be that really comprehensive training piece that we're able to hone in on. So under that piece, we're trying to identify, are there any major initiatives that are happening that are common to all local authorities? And we can capture the data because I suppose the question there is, isn't really directed at how we gather the data, but I suppose that's my focus. Their question is on how much activity is happening. And all I can say is, and it's back to this, I suppose, anecdotal response, there's a lot happening and it varies from local authority to local authority. And also really heavily influenced by um, the activity of the CAROs in the area. Thanks, Bernie. So I think you've, you've partly answered one of the next questions actually by Mary Ann Harris. So she's talking about, I suppose, the you know, this good point about the anecdotal evidence and, you know, there's obviously all this knowledge within local yeah. authorities. Um, so she's asking, you know, so much is, information is there, but maybe not readily accessible or needing some restructuring to be collected so as to be useful. And yeah. could you suggest how this might be done? Yeah, look at climate action KPIs are only one element. Um, they're the big picture. They're the big things uh, that need to be tracked. 
But there are other methodologies. I mean, like across all the policy areas, look, we have methodologies such as case studies. There's, um, you know, good practice conferences. There's a whole range of initiatives and they're, they're really being dealt with at a delivery um, level through the CAROs, through the local authorities specifically, but then also being managed very comprehensively um, at this top sector level. Because while we have the CCMA, the City and County Management Association, and that's the ATN committee, which has five chief executives and eight directors of service, so it's trying to represent the whole sector. And they are also belonging to, there's a, a a local authority climate action steering group that involves the wider sector. So the EPA, the government departments and, you know, the big players. So there's a lot of cross fertilization. So there are it's an unusual policy area, like I say, that there are a whole pilot channels that those informal as well as formal data collection processes can feed up to. They can be collated, um, interpreted and passed on. So I I acknowledge absolutely the questions that's being asked. And I acknowledge that what I'm talking about today is one method of data collection, but it is not the only method. And there are a range of, of tools being used to gather that information. And the CAROs issue a newsletter, um, I think it's every month or every quarter, and it lists every single um, initiative that's happening out there across the the various local authorities. And so there, there are good communication sources out there, but it's just that there's so much happening across a wide sector. It's really difficult to put it all together in one central, um, you know, home. Great, thanks. And there's actually, there's a useful reference, I think, um, uh, that Dorothy uh, Stewart has put up in the in the chat um, on public uh, private or um, public participation networks, I think that people would yeah. be um, uh, interested in. Um, I just might take a couple more questions on Bernie's and then I just want to wrap up with a sort of a cross-cutting theme, if I may. But um, so they're a really interesting question, actually, around the public lighting um, yeah. uh, sort of action. So this question from Derek is, um, when changing public lighting for more energy efficient models, did local authorities take any advice on the negative impacts for insects, moths, etc., um, which bats and um, protected species uh, feed on? So any um, <laughs> any consideration of that? Um, I the, um, the more you know, biodiversity impacts. I say, the same absolutely. I suppose, look, the KPIs haven't focused in on that. They're really just focusing in on um, the rate of rollout of, of the scheme. Um, now, I do know those issues have come up and they really are dealt with. Um, I know it sounds like I'm putting things off, but I'm not. But they, they really are dealt with at the moment um, on a local by local authority level and then through the CAROs. But that will be fed up then into that national steering group. And um, that's the point at which decisions would be made about, you know, if if a sectoral view needs to be taken on that and what needs to be done then to try and counter any negative side effects that may actually be as a consequence of changing over to the LED lights. Because look, at there's very little change anywhere that doesn't have unintended consequences. Um, so what has to be balanced at all times, um, do the pluses outweigh the, outweigh the minuses? And then to look at the minuses and see, is there anything we can actually do about this? So all I can reiterate is the process and the systems and the infrastructure is there to try and address any of the major negative fallouts from that particular project. Okay, thanks, Bernie. Um, So there's actually a couple of other questions, um, which I might get you just to respond to people in the chat um, or in the Q&A. So one, I suppose, is around the the monitoring of the deliverables, um, which I think is a really important question here. Um, But I might just finish. um, There's one specific question for Jean, and then I've got a sort of a point around inequalities, which I think I might put to the panel. So um, the question for Jean, are recreational waters, including coastal bathing waters, a particular risk pathway for crypto and VTech? Yeah, I saw it there in the chat. Um, I, not at an appreciable level anyway. I'm sure there's a sporadic case every now and then, but uh, it, it's it's less likely than a drinking water route. Right. OK. Um, so everybody, we've got about one more minute to like, let you go at 12.35, five minutes over. So I suppose um, a couple of people mentioned this um, in talking through their presentations. It was the issues around um, inequalities. Um, so I suppose, Bernie, obviously, in, in developing and Darren in developing your KPIs, I wondered, was there sort of any sense of trying to track, 
I suppose, um, particularly vulnerable groups um, or particular, you know, inequalities across the population, maybe in um, exposure to climate uh, change. We obviously uh, know at a sort of a global level the, the inequalities that might arise. And then, Jean, you you mentioned, I suppose, um, uh, you know, obviously the population exposure and you've done really, uh, I think, really interesting and excellent work on the small areas. But presumably that can allow you to get a bit of a handle, I suppose, on inequalities in infection risk. Uh, I suppose we know from from COVID that, you know, infection risk wasn't distributed uh, equally across the population. So maybe you might pick up on that. But um, I'll go to Bernie first and then Jean to sort of wrap up on the inequalities piece. Um, okay, at, at this point, Anne, it's not a focus of the KPIs because they're very macro at, at this point in time. But but it is a really, really important issue. And it's an issue really across all the policy areas, um, across local authorities. Um, now, just say local authorities deliver over a thousand different services. Um, they report into 29 different government departments and agencies. And so, so it's a massive patchwork of activity out there. 600 of the services are common to all local authorities, but you have 400 that are unique to different circumstances. Now, I suppose what we're trying to do from a research perspective is to look at the data collection across the sector and to say to people that we cannot track um, the access into services of targeted groups unless we gather the data. Because people use GDPR as a, as a real reason for not gathering sets, you know, sensitive information. But what we're saying to local authorities is, particularly designing new systems going forward, that you can ask it once it's voluntarily answered. Because until like we, we don't have a lot of data in relation to some of the sensitive um, or targeted populations. Now we do in some areas like homelessness and housing and so on, we have the data there. But around climate, it's difficult at the moment. And like I say, we're, our focus is still just on the macro, but as an issue across local authorities, it's something that we absolutely acknowledge. We have the, the public sector duty under the IHREC and have attended conferences with, with the IHREC because this issue around data protection, it's a big limiter, limiter for us. So it's something we acknowledge. It's something that we will be working on um, as, as a sectoral issue and something that we hope in in three, four, five years time, we should be able to start reporting on, um, you know, vulnerable groups and their access to an impact of services being delivered by local authorities. Great. OK, thanks, Bernie. So, Jean, I might leave the last word to you um, on inequalities before I wrap up. Yeah, there's just definitely an infrastructural inequality. So the second you, you move away from the um, public water infrastructure, you move into disease territory, essentially. Um, so the only way to, to fix it is to extend the water, the public water network to the whole country, which is probably not feasible, um, or to empower people to protect themselves through funding schemes for treatment or things like that. But especially, I suppose, it's all very complicated in line with the, the housing crisis and things like that. More people have been pushed into rural areas um, over the next coming few years. So it's an issue that will be around for a while and the solution to it isn't, isn't clear, but there's definitely an inequality, yeah. Great, okay, thanks very much, Jean. Um, so I'd just like to, I suppose, to end by thanking everybody for um, all your questions and engagement uh, this afternoon. Um, and obviously I'd really like to thank uh, all of our speakers uh, today. I think it's been a really uh, great programme um, and I've certainly learned a lot from it. Um, and I think there's a, you know, there's a couple of themes, I think, um, that obviously uh, we may pick up on in our research program, but I think more generally in terms of, I suppose, dissemination of uh, results and, and in talking to uh, policymakers. So I mentioned the inequalities piece, obviously, um, but I think, you know, data access and sort of how we design data collection uh, systems to make it um, more usable, both for researchers, but also for, for data users um, uh, more generally in the public service. Um, I think are, are, is another theme which we'd really like to, to follow up on. So um, we will keep you posted and hopefully we'll have uh, many more of these events. And um, as Alan said at the beginning, hopefully um, in person uh, soon. So thanks very much, everybody. And um, uh, we'll talk to you soon again. Bye bye.